In October 2012, Pure Carbon Ent published on YouTube a three-minute film called Existence in Infinite Space, in which he claims that it is impossible to determine where we are located in infinite space, that is, whether we exist at the top of the universe or at the bottom of it, because space being infinite, there is no top or bottom. Furthermore, he imagines that if we were floating gravityless in infinite space without any reference point except ourselves, but we felt we were floating upside down and wishing to right ourselves, rotated 180 degrees, but still felt that we were floating upside down, we would have no way of knowing which side is up, since, without gravity pulling our feet to the ground, or any other reference point to orient us, direction in infinite space would extend, so to speak, in every direction. Children spin around, then suddenly stop because they enjoy the sensation of feeling dizzy without moving. By drawing our attention to the fact that we exist in a space not bounded or curved or mobius stripped, but one that without the slightest hesitation sixth graders anywhere in the world will declare is infinite, Pure Carbon End offers us the opportunity to spin around mentally so that we likewise may enjoy the pleasant sensation of being disoriented. But that pleasant sensation is just the bait. If you take the bait and run with it for a number of years, keeping your mind open by never forgetting that you were once a sixth grader, you will discover to your astonishment that however divergent their views in other matters, the two ideas that the most celebrated minds in the history of science, philosophy, and religion have considered naive or irrelevant or irrational, and having dismissed them as ultimately beneath their notice, even when they quietly invoke them to prop up their own theories, have driven them beyond the pale of intellectual respectability. A suppression that has been so successful, and in the case of mathematician George Cantor, <clears throat> a triumph of suppression that is nothing short of genius, that when pure carbon ant defies the taboo against taking seriously infinite space in particular and infinity in general, the two ideas I refer to, one can only admire his audacity. Because infinity, while nameable, is inconceivable and therefore beyond anyone's power to control and manipulate, the very mention of it bristles with defiance of authority, whether secular or divine, the representatives of which pride themselves on their ability to control and manipulate the culture. <clears throat> and even though as early as the 6th century BC, the pre-Socratic philosopher Anaximander declared infinity to be the essential characteristic of nature, since then, the conspiracy of silence in regard to it, transmitted over the centuries from one establishment to another, has been so effective that no one any longer even thinks to mention it, except to brush it aside as inconsequential. History, however, records a few nasty exceptions. Ancient rumor has it that when one of Pythagoras's students disclosed in public that the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter did not divide evenly, as might have been expected of a divinely ordered science, but instead, like a god dribbling behind it an endless trail of doo-doo, left a scandalous remainder, which we, still embarrassed by its formless random infinity, call pi, the snitch was silenced forever. Some centuries later, in the year 1600, the censorship still firmly in place, the Catholic Church roasted in a makeshift outdoor oven 
Juan Giordano Filippo Bruno for declaring the very same idea that pure carbon ant offers as food for thought, namely, that space is infinite. With the added Philip on the part of Bruno, that since God created space, God likewise must be infinite. What? God infinite? Kill the fucker! We might well wonder why the church reacted so violently, for it seems self-evident that if God created infinite space, but the Creator cannot be less than its creation, then God cannot be less than infinite. Why then did such an obvious notion turn the church to murder? For this reason, if God is infinite and also all-knowing, and in particular knowing everything about himself, then God is an infinity aware of itself. But for an infinity to be aware of itself, it must comprehend itself as a unity, because that's what self-awareness means, namely, to be conscious of oneself, not only as one and the same person, but as distinct from every other person. But here's the problem. A unity is by definition bounded, that is, sealed off or insulated from every other unity, in the same way that the number one is distinct or demarcated from every other number. So, for God to be aware of himself, he must be a bounded infinity. But infinity, by definition, means without bounds. Therefore, if God is infinite as well as aware of himself, God is incomprehensible, a conclusion which trashes every scripture or sutra or sura whose intent is to make God comprehensible. For infinity exposes the ethical ideals of religion, namely the fidelity of Jews and Christians, <clears throat> the purity of Moslems, the mindfulness of Buddhists, as nothing more than contaminants of the inconceivable, as futile attempts to downsize God in order to format him to fit our screen. Once formatted, supremacy, that is, the supremacy of the creator over the creature, usurps the place of infinity as his principal characteristic. Consequently, sanctified by religion, supremacy or lordship acquires a preeminence in human affairs that justifies the domination of the powerful over the powerless, the wealthy over the poor, the expert over the amateur, the talented over the untalented, that all but obliterates the equality inherent in the idea of a God equally accessible to all, but at the same time equally incomprehensible to all. That's why the Church murdered Filippo Bruno, because by sharing his thoughts about infinity with the same frankness that pure carbon ent expresses when he thinks aloud about infinite space, Filippo cracked open the door of infinity, and that's forbidden. The reason it's forbidden is that, unobtrusive as it is, the disorientation we experience when we puzzle over infinity induces a very radical state of mind, which arguably is also the most spiritual state of mind a human is capable of. I call the state of mind radical because, as I say, it has the potential to undermine the authority of the founders of every institution and their successors, who boast that they know why we are alive and likewise what we should do about it, when no one can even begin to explain how it's possible for the space we live and breathe in to be infinite. Therefore, Infinity deflates authority, while at the same time it clears God's name of complicity with the powers that be, who, in the name of heaven, have succeeded in driving human history into the ground. As for the spirituality of infinity, 
By acknowledging that we exist in infinite space, we experience a natural high that is, I maintain, as close as we can get to divinity without desecrating it. Furthermore, once we enter that state of mind where all creatures are equally dumbfounded, we see at once that the god of religion is merely the raw material of spirituality. But to worship that god is to eat the menu while waiting for the meal to be served. The fact that God is incomprehensible has unfortunately led many to throw up their hands in rational despair and conclude that God does not exist. But one might just as soon conclude that space does not exist, just because it's infinite and therefore beyond comprehension. Besides, whether God exists or not is his own business. Our business is with each other. Our business is redesigning a world that not a single person is not proud of having participated in creating when it comes time to leave it. In the meantime, the black magic that makes us cry out in anguish, the white magic that makes us laugh with joy. Why, there's not a child living that doesn't know that to be alive at all is to suspect magic. That suspicion is our tribute to God. When, however, we are pressured to move beyond suspicion into conviction, because conviction is the mortar that keeps the establishment in place, and encouraged, moreover, to know God stripped of his infinity, it is my belief that we are being enticed to see God naked. And that, in my opinion, is spiritual pornography. So the euphoria that pure carbon end invites us to experience when we contemplate infinite space is really a kind of light-hearted ecstasy, spiritual in nature, but lacking the fanaticism we associate with religious conviction. Lacking it, I think, because all that's required to contemplate infinite space is an open mind, Unlike religious conviction, the possessors of which secretly pride themselves on the special favor granted by God to those chosen to enter his sanctuary, and who likewise imbibe the contempt reserved by God for those who refuse his invitation. I don't know whether pure carbon end would agree with all I have claimed, but I do know this. For anyone who lets it sink in, pure carbon ends brief exposition of infinite space has the same potential to proliferate in one's mind and produce fresh thoughts and images as has that mustard seed to which Matthew in the Gospel compares the kingdom of sky. The kingdom of sky is like a grain of mustard, he writes, which a man takes and sows in his field. It is smaller than all other seeds, but once it has grown, it exceeds all vegetables and becomes a tree so that birds of the sky enter and roost in its branches. Postscript on the Theory of the Three Wombs A bird of the sky that roosted in my branches as a result of thinking about infinite space, I call the theory of the three wombs. For it seems to me that we are born out of three successive wombs, one womb set within the other. The maternal womb, which is physical, where we receive life. The paternal womb, or world, which designed for the most part by men and ever expanding or contracting, is where we make a living. And the eternal womb, which is of the nature of myth or fable, whose invisible walls we mentally press up against when we arrive, as Dante Alighieri puts it, at the middle of the journey of life, or, in current parlance, when we experience our midlife crisis, 
That is, when we reach the age that is equidistant between cradle and grave and feel compelled to inquire what our relationship is with the eternal or infinite. If we penetrate the myth of the eternal womb, and yes, it's possible to get stuck in any of the wombs and die physically, economically, or spiritually, the life we are born into, like all things sacred, is hard to describe because it partakes of the infinite and therefore is rife with paradox. In any case, this last phase closes with death. The sojourn in the maternal womb must be the happiest of the three. I think so because in the photo my former neighbor Ramona sent me of her newborn baby taken shortly after his birth, Raphael appears inhumanly beautiful, as if he were an angel whose wings had yet to unfold. When, however, I compare a second more recent photo with the first, I note that his face already registers an infantile anxiety. In this photo, Raphael has opened his eyes, but they remain unfocused, as if he were looking inwardly, his hand thoughtfully resting on his chin, attempting to decide, as if it were in his power to do so, what human shape he should assume, he should assume lest he be taken for an angel and put in a zoo. Let me show you the pictures. There are three here, two little ones and one big one. The one in the middle is Raphael the angel. You can see he's, uh, I don't know, he, he, to me he doesn't really even look human. He looks superhuman. He looks, uh, he looks angelic. Now here's the second photo I refer to, the later photo, where he's opened his eyes and uh, he's contemplating how he can stay out of the zoo for looking so angelic, and he is assuming the, uh, the shape of a human, in this case, uh, pretty much like Alex, his dad. To continue the theory, mother and child exist within the larger paternal womb called world. In this womb, the wealthy play the role of mother, while the hands-on producers of wealth, the working classes, inasmuch as they depend for subsistence on the wealthy, who create new enterprises and provide jobs, enact the part of the infant. But just as when the infant in the maternal womb increases in size to the point that it must be born or perish, so the working population likewise increases in number to the point that it also must be born from the womb of wealth or perish inside it. So long as the global economy, the man-made womb, expands annually at the requisite 3%, the number of infants nestled within it can likewise multiply without danger to mother or child. But when the womb of wealth no longer expands, but on the contrary begins to contract so that the number of infants kicking within it is too great for their host any longer to support them, then the wealthy, many of whom subscribe to the pro-life belief that the living button glued to the uterus of the pregnant woman is, al is already in, in let me do that one. Uh, again. But when the womb of wealth no longer expands, but on the contrary, begins to contract so that the number of infants kicking within is too great for their host any longer to support them, then the wealthy, many of whom subscribe to the pro-life belief that the living button glued to the uterus of the pregnant woman is already in embryo the whole suit of clothes. As if oblivious of their pro-life stance, methodically perform a global holocaustic abortion of the working classes, 
which, taking the form of massive unemployment with no relief in sight, condemns those classes to death by poverty. The wealthy, moreover, defend the abortion with the fantastic argument that by being aborted, the infant has taken its own life. Well, I say, well, as I say, the working classes must either be reborn from the womb of wealth or perish within it. Rebirth is not inevitable. Those who understand that do everything in their power to induce labor, that is, to foment revolution. Rebirth from the paternal into the eternal womb, then, must be massive, must involve thousands of infantomites for each one of them to be successfully reborn. On the other hand, by taking various devious paths that lead out of the paternal womb, individuals are able to exit it separately one by one, but lacking the numbers necessary to discard it entirely, they remain attached to it by an economic umbilical cord which is always on the point of strangling them. In other words, the escapees espouse egalitarian ideals in a hostile, hierarchical world which alienates and marginalizes them. The cosmological myth that God created the universe is invaluable to the powers that be because it establishes hierarchy in the form of the natural superiority of the creator over the creature as the paradigm for social order and so lends divine authority to the rulership of the more powerful over the less powerful. Since the eternal womb is deformed by cosmological myth, we must be born out of it if we are to expose the creator it sanctifies for what it is, namely, a makeshift divinity, a wizard of Oz, and replace it with the sense of the infinite. Under the spell of the infinite, the answers we demand of God gradually lose their urgency as our burning questions, the very words which compose them, burn to ashes and blow away. I've touched upon how by thinking about infinite space we reunite, re-infinite with the real and genuine eternal. But into what kind of existence is one born after emerging from the artificial eternal? Here, since I am but newly arrived, and ridiculously so, inasmuch as I trail an umbilical cord which attaches to the paternal womb, I can only speak for myself. Since I don't any longer feel under compulsion to be reborn, viewing death simply as incomprehensible as life and letting it go at that, it is the prospect of being killed that is humiliating and catapults death into an object of horror. I no longer appear to be enwombed. I mean, I didn't outgrow the maternal, paternal, and eternal wombs because I thought it would be an interesting experience. I had to get out of them or suffocate. Now, much to my surprise, I suspect that I myself am pregnant. I don't know how I got pregnant. Consequently, I have no idea what sort of creature is growing inside me. All I know is this, that upon dying, I will go into labor, but will not survive to see my baby. But that's okay. What's important is that my baby live. Why is that important? because life is all I know. It's all I have to give.